Campfire, I hope, is going to help the world in another way too, which is this. We're trying to help people disseminate their knowledge and the breadth of their experience to people not only domestically inside the US, but also right the way around the world. Welcome to the Networking with Michelle podcast, the show dedicated to providing you with life strategies with a little bit of entrepreneur advice. Here we believe in the Jim Rohn quote, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. Hey everyone, welcome to the Networking with Michelle show. Today's special guest is Chris Dolce Shepard, and he has started and sold an airline, Air Thalassa, a Greek airline. He went on to help governments and entrepreneurs in Africa to start airlines of their own. Now he is co-founder of Campfire, a revolutionary audio app that pays users to ask great questions to their favorite experts, celebrities, and podcasters. Christos, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hi, Michelle. It's great to be here. I'm very well indeed. Thank you so much. Seems like you have done a lot in a short amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try. A very impressed bio. Um, how did you start an airline? I mean, it sounds very overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, starting an airline, uh, a bit of a difficult thing to do, honestly. Um, and actually made even more difficult by the place in which I chose to start this airline, which was, as you mentioned before, is Greece. Uh, Greece, along with most European countries outside the UK and Ireland, um, has a code of, of uh, civil law, which basically means that you can only do things which are permitted by law. Uh, in other words, if, there's, if there is no law allowing you to do something, you can't do it. It's quite the opposite of what we're used to in the US, where laws specifically ban you from doing things. Anyway, long story short, there, were no, um, there was no law that authorized the operation of seaplanes in Greece. And Air Thalassa was a seaplane operation. We operated planes that landed on water as well as, on the, as, well as at regular conventional uh, airports. Um, and so the biggest hurdle, the biggest challenge was lobbying the government to introduce legislation that would authorize and allow seaplanes to operate in the country. And of course, you know, I just graduated from uh, university. I was like 20 years old at this point, maybe 21 years old at this point. Um, and I was a history major. So I knew nothing whatsoever about airlines, let alone about how to negotiate with national governments. What I was able to do, though, was to persuade um, you know, people who were much older, wiser, paler, and more experienced than I was to, um, to to help me, I guess, on this question. I mean, to help me for money, of course, and to help me for equity, obviously, but to help me. And uh, it was really those people that, because I was able to surround myself with those people, that, that we were re really able to get the airline off the ground. Um, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's one of the lessons that I carry with me today as an entrepreneur at Campfire and in the other businesses that I've helped to start in the interim is really like you can do anything that you put your mind to so long as you surround yourself with the right people. I love it. I like how you said persuade. And in this case, you were persuading people that were older than you, more experienced, obviously has some financial um, backing. Do you recall what your network looked like at the age of 20? <laughs> Um, well, that, that it was, it wasn't great. It wasn't, it wasn't a great network. Um, you know, I, I was, I, I think, I think it was okay. You know, I went to, I went to great schools for which I had my parents to thank when I was a teenager. Um, but the network out of which F. Alice grew was a network that I carved out for myself. Um, partly through fortuitous, you know, sort of uh, serendipitous interactions and meetings with people, but also partly because I went out there aggressively to try and actually identify the people that I needed. So, for example, I discovered um, not long after I got to Greece that um, one of the biggest places where seaplanes operate in the world is Vancouver, which I had no idea about at the time. Um, they have a three or four, five different airlines that are all operating seaplanes out, out of the harbor there. And so I decided about three weeks after I got to Greece, right, I need to get on a plane and go to Vancouver. So I, I went to Vancouver, set up meetings, cold called people. And, you know, I actually ended up hiring two people uh, from there who formed part of the core team, our COO and our CCO. Um, you know, and, and so that's that's kind of what I mean. You've got to kind of like put yourself in the way of opportunity and knock on doors. I commend you. Now, we're fast forwarding way ahead now. Um, Campfire, I had a chance to play around it. It's an awesome app. It's an audio app um, that allows you to ask questions to experts. So how did that concept come together? 
Uh, well, you know, my co-founder, Nick, uh, and I, we spent two years in Silicon Valley. And we were surrounded by um, people who kept coming up with these incremental innovations that were really only designed to help a very narrow band of elite users, usually kind of like middle-aged white men in Silicon Valley. Those were the customers of these companies that, that, that we saw all around us. You know, like here's another app that helps you locate a place for your dog to take a poop or you know, stupid stuff like that. And I think what we, what Nick and I were really gunning to do was to, to, was to build, was to leverage Silicon Valley's technology and the networks that we had developed in Silicon Valley over those two years and, 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 and sort of direct it in a way where we could do some profound social good. Um, now, Campfire does, right off the bat, help people to do social good because you can make money by asking and answering great questions on the platform. Um, and you can then in turn donate some or all of that money to your favorite charity or whichever charity you choose to support. In the most recent week, the most popular charity that's been donated to on Campfire has been UNICEF in support of the victims of the Caribbean hurricanes and the Mexican earthquakes. Uh, but beyond simply you know, leveraging and harnessing the power of social media to do social good in a very sort of uh, obvious way, um, Campfire, I hope, is going to help the world in another way too, which is this. Um, we're trying to help people disseminate their knowledge and the breadth of their experience to people not only domestically inside the U.S., but also right the way around the world. People like my co-founder and I have been very privileged in our lives. We have great access to, you know, intelligent, knowledgeable people, rich people who can invest in our businesses, uh, you know, great professors, great uh, university faculty members who, who've helped us along the way and things like that. And it's easy to forget that if you drive, you know, five miles east of Silicon Valley, you, you end up in, I mean, really, it's a ghetto, I'll be honest. Like, people don't have opportunities in those places because they don't have access to knowledge and expertise and perspectives which I and Nick take for granted. And let alone, you know, five miles east of, of Silicon Valley, let alone kind of, you know, Flint, Michigan or, or, or somewhere like that. Think about people who are growing up in places like Accra in Ghana or, or Nairobi in Kenya or, or Dhaka in Bangladesh. And the fact that these people not only have no chance of meeting uh, experts or thought leaders, they also have no real chance of meeting people who've ever in turn met those same experts and thought leaders. So trying to disseminate expert knowledge, you know, to people who currently can't receive it, um, notwithstanding the growth of the internet and of social media, still, despite those things, still cannot receive, don't have great access to uh, expert knowledge. Um, that's something very much that Campfire is designed to do. And it's one of the things that Nick and I were thinking about, as I say, when we were in Silicon Valley, like, what should we do? Like, how can we harness this network and these, these skills and the technology that we see all around us to do some good for the world? Yeah, I w I'm here in Houston. And just a month ago, we had Hurricane Harvey. And I think one of the most positive things from social media was just posting um, information and resources to whether it's to rescue people, to get them to shelters, um, food, clothing, donations, and then all those things. And uh, it's it's one of those things, it's overwhelming love when you see the work being put in. But it's like, okay, we don't need to wait to have a natural disaster or something in order for us to use social media in a more positive experience. Um, yeah. How, how, like, how can we make social media a more positive experience on a consistent basis without something negative happening? <laughs> well, uh, it's a great question. First of all, you can download Campfire. <laughs> it's the first way to do it. Um, I think, you know, I don't think that, that we as individual actors can really make social media a nice place. Um, fundamentally, at least for, when I speak for myself, I feel horrible when I go on social media. If I go on Twitter, then people are just trolling me and, you know, saying horrible things and swearing at each other, insulting each other. And then, of course, there's Donald Trump, who's kind of the master of, of ceremonies on Twitter. Um, even when I go to Instagram, sure, there's no or not much in the way of trolling on Instagram. But I still feel bad when I go on Instagram because I'm seeing people who have literally placed a filter over their own lives, literally a filter on their lives. 
and so seem to be having a much better time than I have. Like their girlfriends are hotter than mine. Their their you know their holidays are better than mine. Uh, their bodies are slimmer and more muscular than mine. It's like and it, I, so I go on there and I'm, I just feel horrible as a result. I don't think social media is conceived or designed as a way for us human beings to have good experiences to, or to make us feel better about ourselves, which is sad. Um, and to be honest, I don't think there's much that in, you know, we as individuals can do about it. I don't think there's much that the social media companies themselves are really going to do about it either, because of course, social media is a money spinner, making huge amounts of money out of it, um, particularly from advertising and things like that, selling data, metadata. Um, so yeah, I don't really, I don't think it's going to change, unfortunately. Social media panders to our, our lowest vices and to our lowest, uh, uh, prejudices you know it's sad that's very well put um yeah it's i mean i guess it's it's going to depend on the person and who and then who are you going to allow into your network who are you following um and what do you want to see on your timeline and i know i treat facebook a little definitely differently i treat facebook a little bit more intimate i try to know a lot more of those people and I block people because I want my timeline to be as positive as possible. Whereas where Instagram and Twitter, I'm just a little bit more kind of like whatever, maybe because I'm not on there as much. But Well, there's some problems, if I may, Michelle, there's some problems with having too much of a curated timeline as well on whichever social media network you're on. When I think about my friends on Facebook, I'm no better than you at this, by the way. When I think about my friends on Facebook, uh, you know, who are they? They are people, generally, they're people that I've interacted with. So they're people I went to school with. They are people who I've worked with. They're people maybe I've met at parties, and they're at parties because they're friends with my friends. Um, they're people who grew up in the same town as me. They're people who look like me. And guess what? As a result of all of those things, the the people who I'm friends with on Facebook are people who agree with everything that I already think. They have my worldview because they have the same background as me. And so when I go on Facebook, and by the way, as you may have heard in, in the last couple of years now, people aren't getting their news from CNN anymore. They're getting their news from Facebook. So they get 62%, I think it is, of, of, of people underneath the age of 35 are getting their, the, the first point for, for consuming news is now Facebook. And so funnily enough, you go on Facebook, you just see the world reflected back at you. You, you live in this, this bubble, this echo chamber in which none of your prejudices, be they liberal prejudices or kind of Trumpian prejudices, none of those prejudices are challenged. You never encounter somebody who disagrees, or you rarely encounter somebody who really disagrees with your worldview. And so you, you end up with a scenario that happened last November in this country, um, in the United States, where people were astonished that, that, or at least my friends, I should say, on my social media feeds, were, where, how, who, I've never met a Trump supporter. I've never encountered a Trump supporter on the internet. I've never met one in real life. Who are these people? How did Trump get elected? Um, and by the way, I, I, I you know, I, I was actually a, 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 a Brexit supporter. Um, I, I passionately believe in Brexit. I think it's a terrific thing for the UK to have done. But I was very much in a minority among my friends, and and so it was astonishing to them uh, when Brexit happened because they had never encountered, you know, anybody who who. You know, sort of came from a different worldview that they came from. So social media is, is worrying in that sense as well, in the sense that it basically is just forcing us all to live in, in echo chambers. The idea of campfire, though, is very much to be actually an anti-social media platform. So we often get categorized by people like, oh, you're building a social media app. It's really not a social media app because what actually happens is you have to, on campfire, you pay money to ask people questions. And in turn, you get paid when people listen to the answer that you receive. But, but the fact that you have to pay to ask somebody a question in the first place means that you're having interactions with people you don't know. Because, of course, you're not going to pay money to talk to your friends. You might pay money to talk to Beyonce, for example. I mean, this is an extreme example. But you might pay money to talk to Beyonce, but you won't pay money to talk to your friend. And so Campfire is a place where you're encouraged, effectively, to talk to people you don't already know, who therefore don't necessarily share your worldview, and who in turn, therefore, might, might, maybe, just challenge some of the prejudices and the preconceptions that you have. Yeah, I mean, you just stated some good, some very, very good points, because you're right. It's like my connections offline, um, 
they're like-minded individuals. And if I carry them online, also we still share the same views. So I'm still living in the bubble. Um, I never even thought of it. Yeah. <laughs> never even thought of it like that. But that's such a good point. Um, also with Campfire, okay, so um, a lot of my audience were young professionals, early 30s. So we are degreed, have 10 plus years of experience or approaching that milestone. Um, obviously, if I want to ask a question, that's great. But what if, like, how can I be a contributor? Like, how can I answer someone else's question? Is there a process to that? Uh, everybody on the Campfire platform can ask a question. And everybody on the campfire platform can answer a question. We don't distinguish between askers and answerers. Everybody's an asker, everybody's an answerer. If you want to get people to ask you questions, in other words, you want to be the one answering questions on campfire, you've got to encourage your followers, people you know, your podcast listeners, for example, Michelle, in your case, or you know, if you're a, a photographer or some kind of artist of some kind, maybe it's your the people who subscribe to your blog or or your um or your Instagram feed, or whatever it happens to be. Just encourage your existing followers to come and join you on Campfire. When they join you on Campfire, you will make money by answering their questions. And also, they will make money, the people who ask you questions, will make money whenever anybody else listens to your answer. And both you and the people who are asking your questions, you questions can donate those earnings, some or all of those earnings, or none if you want to, to whichever charity you you respectively support so you know that's kind of that's kind of how it works and and some people are, are, are you know who are on the platform we, we only came into the app store about four weeks ago so we're brand new and we have a small community um of about 15 or twenty thousand users right now but there are some users on the platform who are really just prolific in terms of the number of questions they are answering and actually to be honest in terms of the amount of money they've made one of our users in the last two weeks has made about um, about three and a half thousand dollars, if I remember correctly. I think it's three thousand six hundred dollars in two weeks. Now, granted, you know she's an extreme example, but the platform is in its early days. It's in its infancy. We only have about 20, 15, 20 thousand users. You know, if we can scale that, if we can grow and, and have a platform that has tens of millions, or even who knows, hundreds of millions one day uh, of users, then of course the opportunities to make money by asking and answering questions are phenomenal and the opportunities in turn to raise money for charity also become phenomenal. Okay. Uh, one thing you mentioned earlier is um, you have, I guess, started, co-founded several businesses leading up to Campfire. Um, we have a lot of people that are side hustles or side hustlers, side entrepreneurs. Um, Okay. How, what's what's the balance? How do you get started? What's your advice for all of these side hustlers out there? Uh, well, <laughs> sorry, Michelle. First of all, I'm going to be really cheeky and say download Campfire because you can actually turn. I will give you. A, I mean, this is actually a serious answer, but I will I will give a, a, another another uh, answer to the question in just a second. But on on Campfire, as I said, you can actually make money by asking great questions because whenever anybody listens to the answer no i so say you did say that yeah yeah whenever anybody listens to the answer you 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 get paid um and so we do have people who we call prospectors who come onto the platform who are not particularly fans of the person they're asking a question to uh but they're doing it because they think they're you know they, they're kind of almost acting like citizen journalists they're, they're like going in getting answers and then basically effectively what they're doing, selling the answers on and making money as a consequence. So that's one way to, to do a little side hustle. We actually see at the moment a, a lot of uh, user traffic coming in from West Africa, from Ghana and Nigeria in particular, where a lot of people I think are, are interested in using Campfire as a place for their side hustle. Now, having said that, um, you know, leaving Campfire aside, how do you... Um, how do you get your idea off the ground? Well, you know, for most people, it's not really possible to like quit your job and live the life of an entrepreneur. So immediately. So, and, you know, people have mortgages and children to look after and things like that. So I always tell my friends who ask me, you know, what should I do to basically ring fence a portion of their salary, whichever idea it is that they're trying to develop. Um, so take your idea and do whatever it takes to get a a pilot going, a prototype going, a minimum viable product, whatever it is, if it's a product or a service, just get 
a minimum viable product. Beg, borrow, ring fence your salary, sell a kidney, whatever you can do to get to a point where your idea can be validated. And by validated, I mean you test it with potential customers. And by potential customers, I don't mean your mum and your cousin and your girlfriend's friends, because they're all going to, they, those people are all going to tell you, wow, your idea is amazing. And this MVP, this minimum viable product that you've built is phenomenal. Uh, you need to talk to strangers. You need to sit down in front of focus groups. You attend conferences and introduce your product or your service to people and find out what the reaction is. If the reaction is positive, then you can actually go to investors. Um, you can go to investors with not only with proof that your product has viability because you've actually tested it with potential customers, but you've also shown investors that you have the tenacity to take an idea and to bring it to life in the real world. So that's, that's really what I would say in terms of doing a side hustle and then developing it into something sustainable. If you don't mind me asking, um, what was the time period from um, the initial thought of Campfire I guess the the concept, not necessarily the name, but the concept up to getting it to the app store. Oh, that was a long process. So I would say it was probably about a year, um, which was a long time actually for for apps. Um, but we we really wanted to make sure to get it it right, uh, and also to make it scalable. A lot of the issues that new app developers have is they build an app. Really quickly, you can you can build an app in like a week. It doesn't take very long, but can you build an app that is going to, you know, keep up with the pace as more and more users start coming onto the platform? So we needed to build like a, a scalable platform, and in order to build a scalable platform, we needed to raise money. Uh, so we bootstrapped at first, uh, doing much the same things that I just recommended to your listeners. Um, uh, you know, in terms of building an MVP proving it or trying to test it out with potential customers, iterating on the feedback that we got, changing the product in response to the feedback that we got, and then raising money. Uh, the raising money process was a two or three month process. It was an ordeal. It was very arduous. Um, but, you know, we got there in the end. And then obviously, since raising the funds, we've been able to, um, uh, you know, get the app into the app store, I suppose, with some frustrations from Apple along the way, it must be said. Of course. Um, as we wrap up, um, just to make sure, um, Campfire is available in the a um, Apple App Store. Um, are you working on an Android version? Yeah, we are. So hopefully by, I don't know, I'm hoping by Christmas time or the new year, we'll have an Android product. But for iPhone users, yes, you can either go into the App Store, the Apple App Store, and just search for Campfire. It's almost always the first result that comes up. Um, or alternatively, uh, you can, on your iPhone, you can go to get.campfire.fm uh, and that will just take you to the downloads page. So either way, you can you can download it very simply. Okay. And that's get.campfire.fm. That's right. And if any of any, you know, anybody listening has any questions for me about Campfire or anything else that I've done for that matter, I am, of course, answering questions on Campfire. You'll never guess. Um, you should just look me up. Christoph Shepard, I'm, I'm in the app. All right. I played around with it. I was just listening to a lot of the answers. I really enjoyed it. So now I feel challenged to um, get on there and do some stuff myself. But actually listening to you talk about it, I feel like um, Campfire is like an audio Quora. Is that fair to say? Uh, I wouldn't. I didn't liken it to Quora. Um, we, there are a few different things. For, for example, you can make money from this platform, whereas Quora doesn't make money for itself, sadly, let alone for its users. So, so yeah, there are some there are some big differences. But you know, fundamentally, it is about disseminating knowledge. It's about disseminating knowledge from um, people who matter to you as well. Guess I need to direct my attention to Campfire. Yes, you certainly do. <laughs> All right, Chris, I definitely want to um, thank you for your time and everything uh, for being a guest on the show. Remember, everyone, I believe in you and a personal connection leads to influential network. Thanks for networking with Michelle.